with no and want. How to convince our dumb, raging and hidden Mr. Hyde becomes our main task. I've recently come to believe that this can be achieved. I believe so because I begin to see many benighted ones, folks like you and me, commencing to get results. Last autumn, depression, having no real rational cause at all, almost took me to the cleaners. I began to be scared that I was in for another long chronic spell. Considering the grief I've had with the depressions, it wasn't a bright prospect. I kept asking myself, why can't the 12 steps work to release depression? By the hour, I stared at the St. Francis prayer. It's better to comfort than to be comforted. Here was the formula all right, but why didn't it work? Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people, on circumstances to supply me with prestige, security and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. There wasn't a chance of making the outgoing love of St. Francis a workable and joyous way of life until these fatal and almost absolute dependencies were cut away. Because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed. Reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I, I found I had to exert every ounce of will and action to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, indeed upon any set of circumstances whatsoever. Then only could I be free to love as Francis had. Emotional and instinctual satisfactions I saw were really the extra dividends of having love, offering love and expressing a love appropriate to each relation of life. Plainly, I could not avail myself of God's love until I was able to offer it back to him by loving others as he would have me. And I couldn't possibly do that so long as I was victimized by false dependencies. For my dependency meant demand, a demand for the possessions and control of the people and the conditions surrounding me. While those words absolute dependency may look like a gimmick, they were the ones that helped to trigger my release into my present degree of stability and quietness of mind, qualities which I am now trying to consolidate by offering love to others regardless of the return to me. This seems to be the primary healing circuit, an outgoing love of God's creation and his people, by means of which we avail ourselves of his love for us. It is most clear that the real current can't flow until our paralyzing dependencies are broken and broken at depth. Only then can we possibly have a glimmer of what adult love really is. Spiritual calculus, you say? Not a bit of it. Watch any AA of six months working with a new 12th step case. If the case says to the devil with you, the 12th stepper only smiles and turns to another case. He doesn't feel frustrated or rejected. If his next case responds, and in turn starts to give love and attention to other alcoholics, yet gives none back to him, the sponsor is happy about it anyway. He still doesn't feel rejected. Instead, he rejoices that his one-time prospect is sober and happy. And if his next following case turns out in later time to be his best friend or romance, then the sponsor is most joyful. But he well knows that his happiness is a byproduct, the extra dividend of giving without any demand for a return. The really stabilizing thing for him was having and offering love to that strange drunk on his doorstep. That was Francis at work, powerful and practical, minus dependency and minus demand. In the first six months of my own sobriety, I worked hard with many alcoholics, not a one responded. Yet this work kept me sober. It wasn't a question of those alcoholics giving me anything. My stability came out of trying to give not out of demanding that I receive. Thus, I think it can work out with emotional sobriety. If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependency and its consequent unhealthy demand. Let us, with God's help, continually surrender these hobbling demands. Then we can be set free to live and love 
we may then be able to 12-step ourselves and others into emotional sobriety. Of course, I haven't offered you a really new idea, only a gimmick that has started to unhook several of my own hexes at depth. Nowadays, my brain no longer races compulsively in either relation, grandiosity or depression. I have been given a quiet place in bright sunshine. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic. Thank you so much, Veronica, for your read. I uh, always enjoy that. Um, tonight is my distinct uh, honor to um, introduce a man I have personally drug out of $25 a night hotel rooms with uh, piss and beer all over the place. Uh, I, actually went to a, I actually went to a place one time and this guy who was an attendant said, was yelling at me to get that guy out of that room while they were hosing off mattresses outside. Um, so we've, we've had quite a few adventures together and, uh, he's actually a guy who his, he hid from one of my friends. He called him to pick him up, to go to a treatment center or they were trying to rescue him or something. Uh, and he actually hid, uh, underneath a car in a Walmart parking lot, short shirtless in the middle of winter, uh, trying to keep his way out of treatment. So he's, uh, he's a real deal. I've had a lot of fun with him. He's one of my absolute favorite people in the whole world. Got two beautiful kids. Love the guys. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Ham. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Aaron. I'm an alcoholic. Um, yeah, I'll just take it. Y'all are saying hello since y'all are muted. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, Sam. I really do, man. I, I, I feel I, I can't tell you how honored I am to do this. You know, I, I kind of feel like a... <clears throat> you know, on the sports teams in like elementary school, like, you know, there's certain kids that are just terrible and like, but it's a rule that they all have to play like at least a minute, <laughs> like in the fourth quarter, you're up by 30. And it's like, you know, get, my, get in there. Like, I feel like that's kind of what Sam did with me. Uh, I'm just kidding, you know what I'm saying? But I, I really am honored to be here. And Sam, man, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. I don't mean this meeting, just in general. Um, and yeah, it's funny you talked about that. I must like to hide under cars. I remember I was involved with an assault one time and I took off on foot and it was January 1st, New Year's Day. And it was in Louisville, Kentucky. And it was rain and like sleet, like just warm enough where it wasn't snow. And uh, I was in the woods on foot and I saw a helicopter come out with the spotlight. And I remember thinking, I was like, they have heat sensors on those. And uh, my dad had old collector cars, but he had one junk car in the weeds that was like 50 yards away. I was like, I need to get under that metal car to shield the heat. And uh, I started sprinting. The helicopter was like a quarter mile away, the spotlight. Well, I start sprinting. And next thing you know, it was like I was in a football stadium. That, that spotlight's a lot bigger than it looks when it shines on you. And uh, I remember I just put my hands up. I was like, y'all got me fair and square, but I didn't make it to that car. So I'm um, glad to hear maybe I evaded your buddy, but, um, <clears throat> but anyway, no, it just really is an honor to be here. I'm, I'm going to get to it. Uh, you know, enough of that, but, but thanks again for having me. And uh, I don't know, I'm looking forward to doing this, but you know, the emotional sobriety thing, I always get a kick out of that. You know, Sam, you know, you used to do these in your basement, like five or six years ago. I remember my father even came to one, you know, and you'd have these people host it. And I'm like just a basket case back then. I'm a little better now. Um, but I just remember thinking like I could relate to everything that was in there because, <clears throat> you know, I, I, after I went through what I went through drinking, I, I tend to, you know, after close to two decades of that, you tend to kind of blame problems you got on your drinking, like, you know, legal trouble or, you know, financial insecurity. But, uh, or, you know, whatever it is, but, um, you know, I had, you know, I, I, I was unstable before I ever took a drink. You know, it's funny if you ask, I, I'm speculating here, but if you went to like a normal kid, you know, or, you know, a normal person, and you said, what are your, you know, some of your memories of childhood? Like, what are things that really stick out to you or whatever? They would probably say stuff like, you know, we went to the, the cabin at the lake in the summers. And I remember I got a bike, you know, for Christmas when I was six and my best friend was, you know, Josh or my earliest memories. Almost the only thing I remember was just this subtle yet overwhelming sense of just uncomfortability like I mean just and I'm not saying that because that's a kind of a cute thing to say in AA like you know I never felt comfortable you know um but it just there's no better way to put it kind of be like if you woke up tomorrow and you had put on 30 pounds overnight like magically in your sleep and you had like one of those huge pimples on the end of your nose like that doesn't even have like the white just a big red bright red dots and um and you had just this kind of particular odor you couldn't wash off like 
that's kind of how I felt. I'll, like imagine walking around in public like that, just feeling like a little off and no people are noticing you and just a little off your, that's kind of how I felt all the time, except I wasn't overweight and didn't have a pimple and didn't stay, you know, it was kind of like that. Um, and I felt that way at school. I felt that way at my house. I felt that way around kids in the neighborhood. I just, I, I don't know. And, you know, I wanted more than anything I'm going to be vulnerable here. I feel like I'm going to probably be more vulnerable in this meeting than any other meeting I go to. <laughs> but all I really wanted was to be liked by people. And, and I wanted to people to think I was cool. You know what I'm saying? I mean, more, more than anything. And, and I would spend my days, my earliest memories being, you know, five, six, seven, eight. I would come home and just kind of dream about, I don't know, like, uh, like scoring the winning shot on a, you know, you know, sports team, or if I could get this outfit, then I could go to this, or if I could get this role in the, you know, the school product or whatever. I was always just, I'd watch these movies and these TV shows with these popular characters. And I just remember thinking like, how good would life be if I could just, I don't know, like, um, be that guy. And so, uh, I always joke about it, man. It was my mission for many years, still can't be today to, uh, you know, to acquire things that I think are going to make me feel good. And, and I, I've, if I've said this once, I've said it a hundred times, but with me, it's, it's just like ordering things off an of infomercial. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen an infomercial and there's some gadget or, you know, something on there that just looks life-changing and you can't believe they're selling it for $29.99. Like, I mean, it just seems phenomenal. And so it's 3 a.m. and you order it and you get it and it's a lot smaller than it looked on TV and it doesn't work. And you just, you know, that, that feeling, they got you know what I'm saying? Um, that's always what it was like with relationships or cars or money or anything like that. So, um, but I brought all that to alcoholism. Um, and, and, and I'm going to tell just a little, a couple little parts of my story, just to give you a little background. And then I'm going to, you know, relate to the letter. Um, I don't, I could go 20 minutes. I could go longer. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, it, you know, the, the first time I, I hear different types of alcoholics, you know, people, you know, some people drink for, you know, 20 years and develop, you know, traits of alcoholism, some people right off the bat, and I'm a right off the bat guy, you know, the first time I got drunk, the very first night I drank alone, I blacked out, it was on a Monday night off my parents vodka in eighth grade. Um, and the, the thing that happened to me that night, like only a real true chronic textbook alcoholic really gets that. I mean, there, there's no other, there, there's, there's no way to explain it to a person that, that isn't that. I mean, it's just magical sells it short. It's just divine. Like, I mean, everything I could possibly imagine I ever wanted, you know what I'm saying? If, you know, and how I thought I would feel if I got those things, all the little stuff I told you I used to play in my head, it was like getting all that and having those feelings like times, like, I don't know that. I mean, I was just, I was finally just 100% comfortable with me and I would have paid anything for that. Um, and I started getting in trouble right away. You know, I, I went to treatment, you know, almost immediately. And I was in treatment every year for a few years until I started getting in legal trouble. But uh, I ended up one of the first real um, kind of testimonies to my alcoholism, uh, the powerlessness aspect anyway, is in 11 days after I turned 18, I caught a felony. And uh, my brother and I had gotten caught with a stolen firearm uh, and some, you know, drugs within a school zone, a thousand yards of a school a few months prior. Um, and the, the cops had lost that paperwork, the court system. When we went to like get an attorney, there, there was nothing in the system. It was like a glitch or a mess up. So all the detectives kind of we had one coming to us. Um, so anyway, I get this felony and they, they stick it to me and uh, they put me in this thing called drug court where, you know, if you screw up, you go to penitentiary, you know, there's no, you're already sentenced and convicted. Like if you screw this up, you go to prison. And uh, I didn't want to go to prison. Like I was scared of that. Like I would, you know, years ago, if you asked me about that, I would told you I didn't care, but that, you know, I, I was petrified, didn't want to go from the suburbs. You know what I'm saying? I wore a tie to school and, and didn't want to go And There's real killers in there, you know? Um, and I couldn't quit drinking. So I'm drinking in there and then they caught me and they put me in rehab and I was in this hellhole rehab for six months and they gave me a furlough. I had two weeks left. They gave me a furlough to go spend the night at home and, uh, analyze my, what my triggers might be. And I got drunk on uh, mouthwash. I drove to Lexington, Kentucky and I got a hit and run DUI. So they, you know, kicked me out of the treatment, kicked me out of drug court, went to penitentiary. And, um, and it's funny, man, when I got out, like, I mean, they, when they talk about it being a progressive disease, I mean, it really is like all that stuff that, you know, up until that point, that was like a honeymoon. Like, I, I know a lot of people that get sober that, you know, had a lot less than that going on. Like, I didn't even look at quit drinking as an option, but, um, but things just continued to get worse. And I'll get to the, I got to the point where I genuinely um, didn't think I could get sober. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm not, 
you see a lot of people who aren't ready to get sober and their wives or their husbands or their parents will say like, maybe you ought to do something about this. And they say something like, I don't need it or it's not going to work. Or I've tried that. I've read the pamphlet, you know, it doesn't apply. But like, I wasn't being like that. I, I just, I had been through so much that, um, and, and couldn't get sober. And I really didn't think it would work. And, um, you know, on my last relapse, um, I, I was, I, I'll just paint a little picture, but you know, uh, my last relapse, and this was not atypical, but um, I was living in this apartment. I, I'd been sober about 19 months before this and I relapsed. And so I had like some money from student loans. I'm paying for this apartment. And, but uh, I was out there for seven and a half months. And I, I bet you I could count on two hands the, the times I bathed in that seven and a half months. And uh, I was only physically going to the restaurant. Uh, well, I, I was vomiting and, you know, peeing in, in Dixie cups that are littered all around the apartment. And my mom would be afraid I was starving. She'd always send me pizzas. And I couldn't eat anything, you know, when I would, for a variety of reasons, but I was so starving, I would chew this food up to taste it and spit it back out in the box. So after, you know, a day or two, just chewed pizza filled in boxes, those grow mold and then gnats come. And every time I'd get up drunk, I'd stumble across tables and knock everything I just told you onto the floor. And this went on for seven and a half months. And people, Sam, you know, people used to call Sam, they'd be like, Aaron called me drunk last night. And he'd be like, don't go over there. Like call not, call mobile crisis. Don't, I'm telling you, don't even enter that complex. And, uh, and rightfully so. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it was, um, I was, uh, I was getting wheeled into the hospital one time. This is a, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I was getting wheeled into the hospital one time and I just explained the state I was in. I mean, I was a mess. I, I, it's, I was in bad, bad shape and I'm getting wheeled in and this real kind of chirpy, you know, super attractive nurse. Like she sees me on the gurney get when she lights up and kind of in a flirting almost way kind of waves to me. And I, I'm thinking, you know, what, there's no way in hell you know am I hallucinating and so I go uh I never been in anyway I get into the room and the charge nurse comes in and you know the whole you know do you have a history of high blood pressure you know any surgeries and I just I hadn't eaten in maybe week you know at least a week and I said uh I was like is there any way I can get a sandwich or some crackers or something and she has her clipboard and she smacks her clipboard on her leg and looks right at me and almost yelling and she's like we're not a bed and breakfast this isn't a waffle house like you can't just come in here and order food and and I said, I mean, but very aggressive. And I said, damn, I was like, did I do something to upset you? I'm sorry. And it turns out it was my fourth time in there in under three weeks. And I had zero recollection of the first three. You know what I'm saying? People were calling mobile crisis on me, taking me there in a blackout. If you don't have insurance and you're not dying, you get a bag of fluids and a taxi home. Um, and that's why the nurse was waving. She ran, you know, I was a, fuck, I was a regular there. Um, but anyway, it was just, uh, it was bad. And what, what really changed for me, I, I'm really condensing this, but um, there was a time where I, I really wanted to commit suicide. And uh, cause I didn't, you know, I was, I was fully convinced that everyone would be better off without me. Not like in a, not like my mom took away my PlayStation and, you know, and so I'm in a bad mood. Like I, I, I felt like I had every reason to believe that I couldn't get sober. In fact, I'll tell you this real quick. So uh, my brother and I never really got along. We loved each other. And I'm not just saying that because it's the proper thing. To, I mean, we truly always loved each other. But if we were in the same area, we were fighting, you know, just ever since we were could crawl, you know what I'm saying? And that never really changed. So anyway, he never really moved out of my dad's house. And my grandmother passed away in January of 2007. Um, or no, I'm sorry, January of 2012. But anyway, so the summer of 2012, for some reason, I go over to my dad's house and my brother's there and he goes, hey, mid, he's like, I got to tell you something. And I was like, what? And he goes, you know how grandma was buried out at Memorial Gardens East? I said, uh, yeah. You know, he goes, well, the cemetery kept calling the house. She was buried six, seven, eight months ago. He goes, the cemetery keeps calling here, asking to speak to dad. And it's during business hours. He's at work. So I, I tell him he's at work. And he goes, they keep calling, keep calling. So finally, I said, yo, what do y'all want? Like, get, give me the message. I'll relay it to my father. And they said, we need to talk to him about a, a, similar, a cemetery plot he's buying. And my brother goes, you idiot. He goes, that was my grandma. She's been in the ground for six months, you know? And they said, no, 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 this is something different. We know about your grandma, Jewel Ham. We know that this is there. And so my dad gets home from work and my brother goes to cemeteries calling about some, you know, burial plot. And he says, my dad just kind of said, he goes, yeah, he goes, that's for your brother. And, uh, you know, that just kind of, it's not like we're at dinner and my dad's frustrating. He's like, you know what I had to do today? Get a fucking burial plot for you. And you're it, it, no one, they didn't even want me to know about it. It wasn't like, a, it was just not a threat. It was just like, this is coming, you know? Um, but anyway, I didn't think I could get sober. And I remember 
Sam, I don't even know, I don't know if he remembers this or not, but he asked me one day, I was kind of calling people that were important to me, kind of making my peace without like leading on, you know, but just kind of like, hey man, I'll never be able to repay you or whatever, however it went. And he just said, he goes, why don't you come back to AA? And I was like, dude, you know how many, I'd been to treatment 16 times. I'd been in countless halfway houses. I'd been arrested 33 times. I'd been to the penitentiary. Uh, I'd been in the hospital. God only knows how many times. The psych ward, God only knows how many times. The mental hospital, three times. Um, was on probation in two states simultaneously, no license. I, you know, dropped out of my third sophomore year in high school to go to penitentiary. You know, no education, no friends, no money, no relationship, no insurance, you know, just nothing. It's, I love what it talks about in the book. It's like, you know, his problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Like it's at the point where even if I want to change, where do I start? Walk, you no know, car, walk to McDonald's. They don't really even like people with felonies. Like what, even if they do hire me, I'm gonna make what, $8 an hour? How do I pay my court costs? Like I, that, that doesn't afford rent. Like what about my teeth that, you know, cavity? I mean, what, like, who are we kidding here? Like who, who you know, who are we kidding? It, it's, it, it's, it's done, it's hopeless. Um, and it was explained to me, it just said, yeah, it seems that way, you know, but the, the spiritual realm does not operate under human, you know, restrictions. And it's so counterintuitive, but I mean, you know, it's, it, you go to people and you just say, like I just said, I'm in a halfway house, I have nothing, I have no, you know, no. and they say, well, make sure you keep your area clean. And when you go to a meeting, meet three people every day. And if there are any chores to be done, do those. And then call me in the evening and read this in the book. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna save the theatrics here, you know, cause there's, but it, it really, it's just like, that's cute. You know, like I'll do it, but I mean, how, you know, $23,000 in fines, you know, 40 grand hospital debt, convicted fat, you know, like what you want me to read some stuff in a book and clean up coffee spills as a volunteer position. And this is, these are going to, you know, it just, it doesn't seem to, uh, I don't know. I, I, I could convince, I think just about anybody that that's ludicrous. Um, but the, the, the funny thing about this program is the people that are just out of options and do that, somehow their lives get better and the people that are just way too smart and they need the better paying job and move back here and you know this girl on tinder is trying to get sober too and we're soulmates and i, I just i'm telling you this is the smarter economic path they always get drunk and they get silver chips <laughs> and it was fun i'll tell you I, you know it's fun this is true you know I'd been in treat, I'd been in some sort of institute, you know, I, I was in institutions for, I, I, it was 84 months or 92 months or something like that in a 10 year period. I, I'd have to get a piece of paper to figure it out. But, uh, and I was in these places in Minnesota, Mississippi, Louisville, Lexington, Owensboro, Nashville, Atlanta, all around and all over the years, I'd kind of hear what I'm telling y'all, you know, I'd go in, I'd crying about my problems and, you know, just all a mess. And they would just say, Hey man, you need to get a big book, a highlighter, find a sponsor to take you through the steps, get here early. Don't break any rules. Tell on yourself when you think. And, and, it, and it's almost like, I don't even remember why well, actually I do know when this hit me, but it's almost like of all those cities and all those, you know, hamlets and over the decades and everything like that, I kind of just pictured as a whole, like the whole group of people that were all telling me that showed up with their highlighters and the leather little bound around their big book to, you know, um, you know, to represent how serious they were. And, you know, the people I used to pick apart and these people were staying sober, getting promotions, had happy marriages, were good parents to their kids, you know, had money in the bank, were off probation. People seemed to like them. They were getting invited to stuff. Um, and then I had the other group of people that were like me, that were sitting, uh, you know, in the back row, chewing gum, picking apart everything, you know, on dating site, you, you know, you name it, all these people that, you know, this, this AA business is really just mine, trickery and all, you know, and these people are getting silver chips and they're getting locked up and their POs revoking their, you know, probation and they're begging their parents to send them cigarettes and detox. And it just, you would think that would be clear as day. Like you would just see that at one place, but it, it took years and years and years. And it just kind of hit me. You know what I'm saying? I was like, maybe, maybe this isn't a, a, a worldwide conspiracy where everyone in AA gets on an internet chat room at 3 AM and plots, you know, how they're going to manipulate Aaron into coming in to give them a couple dollars a week into the basket and grace them with his presence. You know what I'm saying? And it really hit me. Like there must've been something to like, I, like on a deep level. <laughs> and so for the first time, honestly, it was either this or suicide. I used to go in my closet at my dad's house and hang the shelf in the closet and hang on it to make sure it would support my weight. Because if I was going to hang myself, that's where it was going to be. And I didn't want the shelf breaking on me. So every so often I would go in there and test it. And, uh, and I was going to, you know, it was either going to, you know, do this with everything I had 
or hang myself um, with a couple other things involved. But uh, but anyway, I, I, I truly did this like my life depended on it, you know, and people I almost want to, you know, there's certain things that lose meaning or, you know, that, that you get said so much. But I, I'm telling you, I truly did this. Uh, like my life depended on it. and I honestly don't I, I didn't and now still I slip up I'm human you know what I'm saying I mean did I do one or two you know do I still curse and did, you know of course but I'm telling you you know and and not in a joke you can think whatever you want about this but if so, if I was told to sleep on the floor next to my bed for a month I'm telling you I would have done it um, it didn't have to make sense anymore because me I would gauge the relevance of the suggestions I'd say well is that I mean, well, there's a, actually a shortcut, you know, I mean, I get what you're driving at, but I could probably do it. Th- yeah, I, I get what they're trying to say. They're just not evolved enough to, you know, find the most efficient way to get there. So I'll just, you know, um, and I'd always get drunk, um, always get drunk. Um, so I did it for the first time, man, to the best of my ability. And it, it's so funny. I always thought the best I could hope for, even in my wildest fantasies, when I thought like maybe Aaron won't drink, maybe it'll get bad enough or my consequences will be stacked enough or maybe one day I won't be able to drink. I always thought I would miss it, you know, and I, I would just, I, I would, I would have the kind of not willpower. I don't want to, use, you know, we know how we feel it, but you know, maybe somehow be able to resist it through whatever, but it would always look good. I'd always be jealous of second Avenue. I don't, you know, whatever. And I'm not trying to tell anybody's story or compare, but I mean, I genuinely do not have the desire to drink. I can't tell you the last time I've genuinely sat around and contemplated a drink. I swear. I mean, I, you know, every, this room I'm in right now, it's kind of my room. You know what I'm saying? Once or twice I've thought like, you could go to the liquor store, get about a thousand bottles, a thousand one seven five, stock the closet, you know what I'm saying? Pour, you know, gallons of orange juice, throw your car keys in a river, you know what I'm saying? And just sit every for a glimmer, but it's just, I mean, if I'm being real honest, but the point, but anyway, I, I, let me get back. I don't really think about drinking. If somebody like if after this meeting, one of y'all like asked me for my number on here and text me. And you're like, hey, man, you seem like a cool guy. I'm really not buying into this. Like, you know, my girlfriend works at the strip club down. Like, you want to come for free drinks? Like, I, I would, you know, it, you might as well ask me if I want to cut my finger off. Like, I mean, it just, I wouldn't have to, you know, resist that. Or, you know, I'd just be like, hey, dog, you must have, you know, nah, I, you know, you, you know, call your sponsor. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't really appeal to me anymore. <laughs> but then comes the, um, the emotional sobriety piece um because you know this guy in atlanta it was a funny story he liked to you know 10 or and 10 or 12 years ago like not a lot of people um uh uh were people kind of watch how they talk to me just because, I mean, you could see from a mile away, like I, I was troubled, you know what I'm saying? And uh, my dad was checking me into this treatment in Atlanta and, and I was outside smoking while he's doing like the paperwork. It was in between the indigents, you know, he, I, I'd go to the treatment centers, pay and get screwed up. He, oh, you know, the, the indigent homeless centers for a few years. Well, maybe he's ready now, put him in a, anyway, this is one of the nice ones. And uh, I'm outside smoking, and I'm getting done. And I, I look around, there's no butt receptacle. And, and I so I'm like, screw it. You know, I try to flick the button when the butt was in midair. I hear this, I mean, soup, like a yelling voice, pick up that damn cigarette butt, like, right. And I'm turned around and I, I, this guy had an expression on his face, you know what I'm saying? Like he really didn't appreciate people throwing cigarette butts on the ground, you know, and I, I, can, I know that look, you know, and I, I realized I'm in, I'm in Georgia. I have nowhere else to go. You know, I desperately want, maybe I ought to pick up the cigarette butt. And I asked him about that later. I was like, what's your deal talking to, you know, why'd you do that to me? You know? And, and he goes, I just wanted to see if you were willing. He goes, there's, he goes, there's nothing you can do for somebody who isn't willing, nothing. He goes, but on the other hand, there's nobody that's too bad off to be helped if they are willing. He goes, I was just seeing if you were willing or not. But anyway, he did this. Uh, I'm real careful not to mix AA with stuff they teach in treatment and all this, but this dude did this really cool thing where it's a lot. I'll just, if you follow, excellent. If you don't, don't worry about it. But he made this, this, square box on a drawing board and he made four bo- smaller boxes in it and he put at the top drunk and then sober and then on the side he put pro and con and you know the pros of being sober you know you have more money your family's happy you're not getting arrested you know the cons of being sober sensitive you know shy inadequate bored you know not blah 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 and then the pros of being drunk you know whatever is uh you know life of the party can talk to women you know whatever it is you know feeling comfortable with yourself all this and that and then the cons of being drunk going to jail you know being broke whatever it is and he told me he said 
just by physically removing beverage alcohol from your system, just being physically clean from alcohol and drugs. He goes, you pretty much lose the cons of drinking. You know, when people say there not too many people are going to jail. If you're sober, you're not spending 500 bucks on alcohol. We, you know, those go away. He goes, and just by physically remaining sober, you pretty much gain the pros of sobriety. You know, your family's kind of happy, you're sleeping better, you're not getting fired no more. He goes, and that's what it talks about in the book in A Vision for You. He says, well, you know, ask anybody that's sober, for a few weeks or whatever, you know, work better, feel better, having a better time. He says, you know, we smile at such a Sally. And uh, because he says, gradually, what happens is the, the cons of being sober, that shy inadequacy, worry, nervousness, anxiety, just mild depression, but nothing's really wrong. But I just, I'm depressed. He goes, that starts to creep in on you. He goes, and then you start looking at the pros from drinking, you know, the life of the party, relax, calm, you know, can, you know, enjoy yourself. He goes, you miss those. He goes, and untreated, you, you go right back for that. And like I said, please don't take that in bad. This isn't technically an AA meeting, but, but that's really what happens with me. And I love what Bill talks about. I can work the steps and I can still, if I'm being honest on most days, drift into that. And, you know, it's just it, alcoholism for me is just this, I, I'm going to take, listen to this. I've never shared this in a meeting before. Um, the only people who really probably have heard anything like this are Sam and my wife, just because we live together. <laughs> I didn't want people to think I was sharing it um, for the wrong reasons. I didn't want it to come across as tacky or anything like that. Um, but, or, or, or in, a, in some sadistic way, like boastful or something like that. If I wanted to be like that, I wouldn't have waited three and a half years to share it. It's been three and a half years and I, I've never talked about it. But um, I'll get to this in a little bit. But uh, I, I, and what's worse is I hear people telling these stories similar to what I'm about to say, and I never share mine. I just repeat theirs. But um, my brother was uh, in 2018. I was actually with Sam the night it happened, I think. Um, but my brother was killed. He was in a fight and he was hurt. So at my dad's house, when my dad was out of town, he was beaten so badly enough that by the time the ambulance got there, he had bled. And, it, you know, it was just it was horrible. Um, so anyway, um, that happened. And then two and a half months later, 75 days later, my dad dropped dead of a sudden heart attack. Just, I mean, and, and he took care of him. Said so he went to dot, like it was just totally unexpected. And these were really my, I mean, it was, you know, my mom, my dad, my brother and me, you know, and now it's just me and my mom, my, my parents were divorced, but, um, I was the, uh, obvious, I, I was the only one left. I was the, you know, the beneficiary of my father's estate. And um, without going into detail, like I, I, I it, it was dramatically life changing. And um, uh, like this is the trick. It, it was just it was a it was a big deal. And overnight, my life changed. You know, there was nothing I couldn't do. There was nothing I, you know, I, everything I always thought as a kid. I got this now. And um, I, I was down, uh, I was with my wife, my girlfriend at the time is now my wife, and we were at my dad's vacation home down in Florida, and, um, and I'm, uh, please don't take it, but I mean, just, I'm super nice place, and um, I'm in the jacuzzi at like two in the morning, you know, I got, you know, there's four cars down there that just belong to the vacation, you know, the whole night, it, I'm, I have no responsibilities, no, you know, really not, I'm eating the king size Reese peanut butter cups, you know, the big double decker ones, it's one big cup, but any popsicles, ice cream, and, and really nothing to worry about. And I'm walking around. My, my wife was asleep in the bed. The Simpsons are on TV, and I'm walking around, and all I'm thinking about is suicide. And that's a hand of God true story. And I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't contemplating it. It's not like I was thinking, like, you know, should I hang myself or take a bunch of pills? Like, I don't mean like that, but I just remember thinking how nervous and worried I was. What if my girl does something that hurts me one day? What if I get sued? You know, people, you know, I didn't earn this. I inherited everything. People are probably talking about me like I'm some kind of hack. They don't read, you know what I mean? And, and you know, I, oh, I am thinking of that, you know, just and constantly. And I just remember thinking like, you know, I don't know if I can, God willing, do this for 40 or 50 more years. Every nanosecond is a different, like, you know, atomic flash of just unpleasant emotion. And, um, and I, it just, it hit, I remember this vividly. I don't, I'm not just saying I remember that it happened. I remember this night specifically. And, uh, and it just came crashing down, you know, that everything had dissolved because don't get me wrong. 
having something cool is cool, but it, it doesn't fix what's going on inside of me. I heard a guy saying, trying to fix my emotional or spiritual condition with outside things. He goes, it's like being really hungry and stuffing your pockets with sandwiches. You know what I'm saying? It just, it doesn't do anything. And, um, and it hit me. It, it's kind of a crushing feeling, you know, because uh, here I am, you know, what do I do from here? How, how do I calm this now? And um, one of the things <laughs> that I love about AA is, is how counterintuitive things are. There was this guy, his name's Clark. He could be on here for all I know. He's still sober as far as I know. And we were at this DC4 meeting and it's a rough bunch there. And I, 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 fit, I love that. But this guy kind of looked like, um, and I don't mean, if he's on here, I don't mean this disrespect. I hope you know that. But he kind of looked like he owned, a, you know, a, a, like a, a coffee shop uh, on like Highland Avenue or something, you know what I'm saying? And enjoyed chess, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, called movies films instead of movies, you know what I'm saying? And, and he had this hat on with the building. I'm not, I, I, that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just trying to, didn't, you know, I wasn't expecting anyway. And he has this hat that points straight up in these glasses, but he's super smart and super well-spoken and at least at the time, super spiritually connected and sober. And he says, you know, he goes, people talk about alcoholism, it talks about in the literature that it's the misuse of instincts. You know, we have these social security, sex instincts. He goes, and talks about, in 12, you know, we desire more than our fair share. I want to be a little bit, Sam, I love, you know, get Sam on a good little tangent and you'll hear some some really good stuff but you know just be a little bit cooler than you like I'm not hating I, I want you to be cool too as long as people know that like if, if push comes to shove I'm the top dog you know and uh, a little more money you know little, 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 little. and uh and anyway he goes but it's funny he goes it's almost like God snuck in and put it like when the you know humans are being constructed he gets a break he's like oh wait because we need to balance this somehow and put a catch 22 like in our DNA to where it feels good to do for other people you know it's like a uh, like a back door you didn't know it was I don't know if anyone ever played the original Mario like on Nintendo from like the 80s but if you've played it before you know there's like tricks in there and uh, I remember I was playing my brother was older than me growing up and I'm running down this brick wall one time and my brother goes here kick that the brick right there I'm like what are you talking about kick the brick and you kick it and an extra man pops out it's like oh damn like I never would have guessed that was hiding there and uh and it's the same thing with doing for others like I think like bro like I need I need a really cool outfit gotta have a cool haircut but maybe uh download some filter apps so we can post this beach picture on Facebook and oh I'm gonna get so many likes and people might not say it but I know they're gonna be kind of jet you know and it's just ooh, and, and you get that and it's almost just I don't I don't know it's just it's so plastic it's just so you almost feel dirty at like ooh, that was not um Scott Lee says this beautiful thing uh and I'm, 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 this is like third or fourth party, but he said that there was this <clears throat> woman that spoke and she used to go to the Greyhound tracks and, you know, they put that plastic dog to run around in the, or the plastic rabbit and the Greyhounds chase. And she said one time in the race, the rabbit malfunctioned and uh, all the dogs caught it and realized it wasn't a real rabbit. It was plastic. And, uh, and don't, if you're a Greyhound enthusiast and this information is not factually correct, there's no need to debate. I'm just repeating the story as I heard it. But he says that they had to retire those dogs because they would never race again. Because every time they opened the gates, they, they knew that that was a plastic rat or, you know, what they were onto it. And she said, those dogs are smarter than I am. She goes, I catch what I'm chasing all the time. It's not what I thought it was. Didn't make me feel the way I thought it would. Didn't give me the satisfaction. Nothing. Useless. She goes, but you can put me in the next race and I'm burning around the track. And that's the same with me. And uh, I do that stuff still to this day, man. You know, I'll plan out like things that feed my approval rating or, you know, whatever you want to validation, you know what I'm saying? I will plot something out for like a month. There'll be like an event. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this here or wear this or blah, blah, blah. And you're looking forward to it. It's almost like kid, a kid at Christmas. You know, you're building up to it, sitting on Santa's lap and praying and making a little list that, you know, and then you run down, you open all your gifts and like 22 minutes later, like, you know, I mean, wrapping paper everywhere. The two of the toys are broken. You know, there's no batteries for the one you really like. It's kind of like, huh, like that, you know, that's it. That's it. And, uh, but anyway, anyway, getting back to what I'm saying, the things that really fill my heart today, and I'm not saying this because we're on an emotional sobriety workshop, it's doing things for other people. Like I could go out and I could spend 200 bucks at a dinner at Roos Chris, you know, take a, maybe a nice car or whatever, not, you know, whatever. And I leave and I just feel, you know, 
you know, I'm pissed. I spent the money and I'm full. I'm worried about my weight. It's just, I don't go, I, we, I usually, I find me and my wife bicker a lot on the way home from like dates, but I don't know, but it, not anyway, not really. But the point is it would be like, if somebody say you went to a, uh, you worked all week and you're in the mall at Christmas time and there was an angel tree and you pick a name off there, you know, whatever his name is, and you go and get a remote control car and you bring the remote control car back and the woman at the angel tree almost starts crying she's like how did you know that little dominic like wanted this and you're like what i don't need i didn't even look at the name i just bought she goes this little dot he got you know a dot you know he went to you know his parents gave him up for adoption and when he was one years old he's never met his parents he's seven and all he dreams about and talks about is a remote control car like this is going to make his year he's never had anything this nice you know that feeling and if you're human that you would have then imagine if you're walking away from there and some dude in like a business suit with like a bluetooth on his ears like do you just give something away to free to some stranger and you say yeah as a matter of fact i did he goes what an idiot you worked hard for that money didn't you're gonna give it away like jesus christ economics 101 bro you know what i'm saying never gonna get rich though like i wouldn't even have to argue with that guy i'd just be like bro i'd, I'd pity him. you know i'd be like dude i feel the chunk of life that you're missing is astronomical you know what I'm saying? And that's kind of how I look at, uh, you know, doing things for others. Um, it was something I wrote down. I may have already talked about it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what it was. What time we got? I'm going to wrap up here in a second. So one of the things I noticed, uh, you all know Don Pritch, you know, you probably heard most people, some people probably heard of him. And he talked about, you know, self, he, and he, I, I'm giving credit to every, I'm not trying to steal any of this, but he says, you know, he goes, I, I, I think self-interest is just built into my, my bloodstream. He goes, there's nothing I can do to get rid of it. It's at my very core. He goes, I think this program is really a program of enlightened self-interest. And he goes, and that being that I found the best way to get mine is to make sure you get yours. I do things that I think are cool, wanting like little rewards from it. And it's almost it almost feels greasy to me, but when I, there's that whole, it was like a friend's episode. Like, is there really truly any altruistic act? Because in doing so you get to feel good. And I heard this woman say one time, she goes, I think that's the right kind of feel good. She goes, I think that's like a little treat, like from God, you know, like you, you know, you sat and shook your paw, like, you, you know, I think doing things for other people, I think I'm entitled to feel good. I think that's the right way to feel good. Um, and something else I noticed in the literature there's not a super whole lot of talk about this being a not drinking program. That's what I, you know, one of the, probably my favorite line in the big book, this may change, but it, it, it's between this and another one where it says our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we help may help meet their needs. And uh, it doesn't even say other alcoholics. It just says others. And I mean, I heard a guy cross-reference that to page 62, where it said selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think the root is the root of our troubles, below anger, below fear, below alcoholism, the root. And he goes, naturally, it would seem that the antidote to that would be to do for others. Um, and then, you know, Dr. Bob, <laughs> he's got this thing went right on his deathbed or, or close to it you know if you're a scholar like and I have this a little wrong like forgive me but I think Dr. Bob was nearing the end of his life and they went to him and in, in, in the gist of it they said bro you're responsible for one of the probably the biggest spiritual movement in several centuries like do you you're you know do you have anything else to say like you better make it count you know it's we may not talk to you again and and he says a couple paragraphs and at the end he goes, man, he goes, I could probably condense this program down to two words, love and service. And then at the end of Bill's story, you know, you, you read Bill's story, you know, he talks about meeting with Debbie. He goes, each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself into a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. He doesn't say widening itself into a circle of people not drinking and, you know, no longer getting DUIs in the, the Model A, you know, I mean, I, and don't get me wrong, that's a big part of it. But anytime I look for like the real kind of nuts of this, it's usually helping others. You have a resentment, you know, you pray for them. You wear, you know, sex troubles, go help somebody, you know, uh, two wives, uh, the family afterwards. I had a guy made me go through those and underline every time it said the words patience, love, tolerance, uh, understanding, compassion. That's every, you're arguing, remember, you know, show this, show that. And um, there's no room for <clears throat> hatred for me in this pro if I want to live you know be emotional emotionally sober I've had some bad things had the guy that was responsible for my brother's death walked scot-free Kentucky's got this thing called stand your ground law and I'm not going to get into the whole all the facts of the case um 
but anyway, the, the, the guy is, is completely a free man. I mean, didn't even go to jail that night. They, um, and, you know, I, I've had things where I want to retaliate. And, and you know, here, here's the thing. There are people now that I have new heroes. It used to be tough guys and it used to be people with a lot of money. And it used to be people who were just funny or famous or stuff like that. And don't get me wrong. I, that, that's appealing to me somewhat. But my real heroes today are the people I gauge how much of a hero you are to me by how closely you adhere to these principles. And that's the God's honest truth. And nobody that I respect, you know, Sam, Tom, you, you know, a lot of people on Scott, you know, I just, you, you, you know, there's nothing I could take to them and say, man, I'm really upset about this. This person really did me dirty. I mean, there's no question about a jury 12 on 12 would convict. None of them say, Ooh, that's screwed up. Like, make sure you hold on to that. Like what get, get that anger, screw praying for them. Get that anger, like put it in a nice little oily resiny ball, stick it behind your left ventricle and keep that there. It'll be useful to you. It won't spill over into relationships with your children or skew your perception of society as a whole. No, 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 no. I'd be pissed to hang on to that. And the thing is, it doesn't matter what it is. If somebody vandalizes my house, I'm going to call the police. It doesn't mean being, you know, like letting people do whatever they want. But anger and Aaron Ham do not mix. There's no way to be, you know, I, I, I win every single argument I have in my head and never, ever do I feel better after one. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, oof. Now we got that settled, you know what I'm saying, ever. And, you know, and, and I devote time to that. You know what I'm saying? I'll go in different rooms of my house sometimes to finish an argument in my head. You know, I'll be in the kitchen. My wife will come in. I need to go upstairs and check on something. And I'll be in the bathroom in the mirror like, when I, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, real sick stuff. But, you know, letting that go. But, but probably one of the, let's see what time. Um, got a few more minutes. I'm going to try to go until 830. Uh <clears throat> but let me let me see here i wrote uh, there was a couple of things I, I usually don't write anything down but there was a couple of things i didn't want to forget um hell i can't find it it doesn't matter but <clears throat> one of the last things i'm gonna say is the emotional sobriety i love where it talks about one of my favorite parts that always has been where it says if we examine every disturbance we have great or small we'll find at the root of it some uh, and i don't have it in front of me some unhealthy uh, demand, you know, some unhealthy dependence and its consequent unhealthy demand. And one of my favorite things on the fourth step is ambitions. Um, you know, a lot of I'll sponsor guys and they're like, man, what is ambitions? And I always used to say, I'd be like, man, it's the way you would run things if you were a sorcerer or with control or whatever, you know, if you were in charge, it's how you would have where the world go. And I heard a guy really simply the other day put it, he goes, ambitions is just my way. He goes, ambitions is my way. He goes, and anything that affects my ambitions is anytime I'm not getting my way. And I relate that to the dependencies thing. You dollars to donuts, anything great or small I have been upset about ever, it's because at the root of it, I determined something should happen. I would be happy if it did happen. I'll be sad if this happened. So better not great or small and something conflicts with that. You know, if I walk down and you, hey, baby, you know, good morning to my wife. And she doesn't look at me and she goes, hey, I'm like, oh, what's she pissed about? What did I do? Oh, Jesus Christ. Here we fucking go. I can't go to the meet. You know, what? Uh, and, you know, I mean, it just is it, like, you know, if it's, I want to take a convertible out, you know what I'm saying? And it's rain. It's just like, the, the, what? you know, the, the, you know, yesterday it wasn't saying Jesus Christ. And somebody calls me a sponsor, you know, gee, yeah, deal with it. We've had this count, you know, come in that. And if somebody approaches me, it's just like, man, things, I'm just stressed. You know what I'm saying? I, and I love the old ad, you know, whatever. I don't even know what adage means, but I heard smart people say it. And, uh, you know, like uh, the easiest way to get my way is to not have my way. And that's kind of what boils down to emotional sobriety. If I just played a game where there was like a million dollar prize where people just went with the, whoever went with the flow for the best for a whole week, you know what I'm saying? Uh, won a million dollar prize. You'd see the most peaceful, serene, you know, God conscious probably type of people you'd ever cross paths with in your life. You know what I'm saying? It's just by default. Anytime I'm upset, it's just because I, I place some dependency on something. And, you know, people, I'll tell people that I'll do groups or whatever I do. And they're like, well, you don't understand, you know, my, uh, my I need to get back to work. You know, my wife's going to leave me if I can't pay the rent. And it's just, it, yeah, follow, trace that back. Yeah, she might leave. You won't be able to see your kids. You'll look like an idiot. You'll be in an apartment somewhere. Yeah, and you don't want that to happen. And then they, well, you know, is it, you know, anyway, 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 you can go down that rabbit hole and I would do it if I had more time. But um, I'm just so grateful, uh, you know, that this letter exists. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, I, 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 I say, 
I can't remember. Hey, listen, I, 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 you know, in the part of the book where uh, these resentments fancied are real. Sometimes I'll, I'll be chewing on something that I just made up like 11 years ago and now it's reality to me. So I don't know if this ever happened in reality or not, but you know, I, I was, I was thanking Sam one time and I think maybe somebody shared after me or something. They're like, well, you know, all the power comes from God. Like it's not human power. And I'm th- I was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not, comp- I'm 100% in agreement with you on that, but God does place surgeons on this earth. You know what I'm saying? He places big hearted people who I think are angels. You know what I'm saying? And there's not, a doubt in my mind, you can call my mother, you can call anybody I grew up with, you can call anybody that was within 300 feet of me in active addiction, and they will tell you I would not be here today if something didn't happen, and uh, I I just can't, you know, I know I tell you this all the time, man, I'm not trying to be, I just, I'm going to tell you this until we don't, you know, till it's over, but uh, I just love you so much, man, I, I, I owe everything I have to you, um, and God, you know, and, uh, I'm really grateful you asked me to do this tonight, I hope that fit in with the flow with that. I was just kind of off the top of the door. I didn't want to plan. I told my story a couple of times recently and I caught myself kind of trying to put on an image here or trying to, you know, do, you know, and I leave that meeting and I feel bad. I'm like, Ooh, that was insincere. I, so I didn't want to, you know, I was trying not to curse on here, but I was just with, I was just trying to kind of be myself and talk what came to my head. So um, hopefully that related somewhat, but anyway, I love you guys. I love this meeting, man. And thank you so much for letting me be a part of this from the bottom of my heart. That's it. Oh man, that was beautiful. I really, uh, such a big part of my life and such a big part of my heart. Um, so, um, man, I just got, I got really moved just then. Uh, can you, uh, call on a couple people, Aaron, just kind of play the Hollywood squares and call on Oh boy. Uh, you know, I'm going to call on Tom, you know what I'm saying? I got to call on Tom, man. Aaron, thanks so much, man. <clears throat> that was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I'm sorry I have my uh, little grandson here and he's had issues and I've had to run out and this and that. But, uh, but you know, it's so funny because uh, uh, as you were talking, I thought, <clears throat> well, if they call on me, I've got a, I've got a quote down Fritz that uh, it's enlightened self-interest that if I want mine, the only way to get it is to make sure you get yours. And <laughs> you said that, and I just thought that was so funny. And I found out years later, he stole that from Anthony DeMello. So, you know, nothing's original with anybody, you know, but that, that's so great. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of a, uh, a story. This has been on my mind. I, I made this documentary film that was uh, impossible for me to make. There's just absolutely no way to make it. I mean, I, I knew nothing about filmmaking. I, uh, didn't have the money to do it. I, I, I'm a carpenter. I, you know, I never made a movie in my life. And, uh, but I got this uh, desire uh, back in 07, 08, when I was down in Louisiana, and I couldn't shake it. And I kept hearing a voice saying, you ought to make a documentary about this. And uh, some of you know this whole story. And I, I said, uh, finally, I said, okay, all right, you know, bless it or block it, and I'm good either way. And, and, I, and people started encouraging me down in Louisiana and AAs that I knew and different people. And I think Gary encouraged me, I can't remember. He might've thought I was crazy. But, uh, but anyway, my wife thought I was crazy and I think she thought I was gonna bankrupt us. But at any rate, um, so this is in the very beginning, it's in 09. And I'd gotten a film crew together from, from uh, New Orleans and we're filming in Lafayette at this little cafe called the Cafe des Amis. And I have like six people that I'm interviewing and they're all integral to the movie. And I had gotten permission to to use the cafe, which is where it all started anyway. And so we're all on the sidewalk. There's three guys in the film crew. There's six people I'm gonna interview. And the general manager of the place comes out and says, I don't know anything about this, right? Now I've got a lot of money and a lot of prestige, a lot of stuff on the line here, right? And uh, and you know I said, well, he, you know, the owner said we could do this, you know. And she goes, well, I'll call him. And so she calls him, and he gets back with me, and he says, you know, God damn it, you know, I, you know. And I said, Dicky, you told us we could do. I mean, I set this up with you. I talked to you days ago. Well, all right. And he's, you know, mad at me, and and he says, I'll come back there. And I said, you don't have to come back, you know, just let us into the place. Anyway, so it's all just going crazy. And for some reason, it's not my MO, 
I just took a deep breath. I paused, I relaxed, I took it easy. I thought, whatever, you know, bless it or block it. You know what I'm saying? And I just was willing, I surrendered is what I did. I didn't accept it, I surrendered to it. And, and what happened was he got there, he opened up the door and, and, and the manager did, everybody came in and all the interviews went absolutely perfectly. And it's some of the best parts of my movie, right? So I came back to Nashville right after that and I was talking to my, my son-in-law, uh, Jeremy, and I said, Jeremy, man, this thing happened. I mean, it had all gone to shit. And then I just didn't do anything. I just, you know, relaxed and it all worked out perfectly. And he goes, oh, and the, he's not an AA guy. He's just a guy that's perceptive, right? And he goes, oh, you didn't make it happen. You let it happen. And what I got from that is if I could live my whole life like that, I'd be doing great, man. <laughs> I love you very much. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate you. Me too, man. Call him one more, broski. Where's Skyler at? There's my boy Skyler. Looking at you, man. I knew it. Hey, what's up? I'm Skyler. I'm an alcoholic. I was sitting here thinking about um, the first service I ever really did uh, for AA. It was with Aaron, and he said we were going to go to a detox here in Nashville, and I was going to go tell my story, and I was all excited. I didn't know that it was a detox slash psych ward <laughs> and we walked in and I was just like you know I was starting to feel comfortable and then somebody uh, picked up one of their drinks and like threw it at one of the nurses uh, somebody started throwing some magazines around and uh, then this lady comes up to me and, and, I, and she said you know I've been the fire marshal of this place for 150 years and I was like what the hell have I gotten into this is AA and uh, you know what though I, I didn't walk away from that experience thinking that I had wasted my time. I still got to tell my story um, and I didn't feel sorry for myself. You know, I started realizing then and there, if I wanted to get out of this um, head, I was stuck. I was two months sober. All I was thinking about was myself and my plans and what I had screwed up. Uh, if I wanted to escape that just for, you know, a fleeting minute, if it was an hour, if it was, you know, a day, whatever, I was going to have to learn how to be a service to other people. Um, and from there, I started to get better each day and each day. I started going out to this treatment center uh, that I first met Aaron. Aaron actually came and read the doctor's opinion with us. And I was, I was asleep until I met Aaron. I don't know, I was in a detox haze. Aaron came in, as you, you heard him speak tonight, he was on, you know, he's on fire. And he was, he was making the doctor's opinion, which I had read in the seven treatment centers before um sound appealing to me I don't know maybe my ears just perked up but he said it as somebody who believed the words behind it and when I saw Aaron at the time he had dreadlocks and all this shit and I was like this guy must have done some stuff just like me um and I started to believe that this thing might actually work for me and so whether he knows it or not uh, I have followed through Aaron's footsteps from you know the periphery this whole time and, and I'm about to celebrate five years sober but I've seen Aaron give up more and more of himself. I've, I've not seen him. I've only seen him get better. You know, it's made me want to be a better person. I've, I've seen him have the opportunities to, you know, have this lavish lifestyle, but give so much of it away. Um, it's a it's a blessing to know Aaron. I perked up whenever I saw it was him speaking tonight. Um, I love you to death, man. I, you know, I wanted to say something about this, uh, the, the emotional sobriety um, letter. You know, so the, when the pandemic started and everything started going on Zoom, I got into like a really, really dark place. You know, and Aaron, you were talking about that, thinking about suicide. I never once, you know, and probably in the last four, four and a half years, if I thought about a drink or a drug. But um, when my life changed and all my attachments and the things I used to define myself were taken away from me, I had gotten into a really dark place about who am I? Who am I spiritually? And do I actually have a relationship with a higher power? And uh, somebody at my work gave me that emotional sobriety um, um, letter. And I read it and I was like, ah, shit, you know, it spoke to me. Everything I used to make myself feel better, uh, everything I used to define myself as a person, um, you know, wasn't working for me, just like the drugs and the alcohol. 
And so um, I started reading that every day, every day. And then like every meeting I was in, I was sharing about it. Like it was some new thing that I just discovered. Uh, <laughs> come to find out, you know, it's a whole bunch of people have a meeting about it. Um, but that changed my life. It changed my focus. It, it changed everything from, you know, not drinking and not drugging to um, what does it actually mean to be emotionally sober? And I'm still figuring it out. You know, but I can say that that was the start of me having um, some new revelations in my own recovery, that it, it was much, much more that my problem was than I realized. And the solution was still the same that Aaron was talking about, um, about helping somebody else and getting more involved in service in any aspect. It, it doesn't matter whether it's AA or not. Um, I'm on this earth to um, not take anymore. I have to give. Love you, Aaron. Love you too, brother. Thank you so much, man. That's beautiful. We'll uh, we'll open it up for anybody who would like to share. Please raise your hand. Or this is my favorite part. I just pick on people. Maggie O, what about you? Hey, hi, Sam. Welcome. Aaron, yeah, thanks. Oh my God, that was wonderful. Um, you know, I've been coming to this um, emotional sobriety workshop since early in 2021. Um, I found out about it through a whole series of people. My, my brother told me about it. And I got to tell you, this has saved my life this last year. Um, you know, I think like a lot of us in the pandemic, there were a lot of things that were going on and it felt like the world was closing in on me, you know? And um, I, just coming here is like drinking from a really, really deep well. And for many months, I didn't come on camera and this is the first time I've ever said a word on here. And mostly what I wanna say is thank you. It just means so much to be able to come here and be with all of you um, I'm coming up on 12 years sober, and after hanging out with you guys, I feel like I'm, I'm a baby, like I'm a baby, but I'm alive, you know, and it, and it just, um, it gives me more than hope. It's like, there's a path that I'm on. It's not like it's somewhere else. I'm here with you, you know, and I belong here with you. And uh, I couldn't stop smiling tonight, Aaron. Your style was just, <laughs> it's like, wow. It was perfect for me today. So thank you for calling on me. And thank you again. Love being here. Thank you so much. Beautiful. I'm going to pick on Amy now. Sam, I don't know. I seem frozen. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, well, I'll do the best I can. Just shut me off if I... Uh, is all y'all are frozen on the screen. Uh, I'll just start with having lived through uh, some of that as a member of Aaron's home group. I, I can't tell you how much we love him and are glad uh, he's doing so well now. <laughs> uh, and I was just thinking about uh, your the million dollar prize for who could be the most relaxed. And uh, I would really like to see if we could put that up somewhere. Because it is hard work to relax. There's, to, I mean, you cannot, you cannot teach a sponsor how to do that. I, I have tried and tried and tried. I just, you know, let go and let go. Leave it alone. You know, stuff will run riot. And then one day they will come in and will say, "I heard the greatest thing in a meeting," and you know, it's exactly what you've been hammering home, you know, all that time. And uh, suddenly they get it at least for a little while, I always say, please write it down and put it most specifically on the front door, the back door, and the telephone. So before you get out, go do your little plans and designs, uh, you will remember how much better off you are if you just let God take care of these things and how the greatest miracles happen. And, and I said to somebody else, I said, God is not going to happen we're in the way so uh i'm gonna stop now because i really don't know how much of this y'all are hearing but uh great talk aaron thank you so much and love seeing you and uh seeing you so happy thanks beautiful thank you amy, thank you, amy. love you hey what about uh my buddy chris h thanks sam hi i'm chris i'm an alcoholic 
And uh, Aaron, just thanks so much for your share. Um, in terms of, of hope for anyone who's struggling or, or asking questions about the viability of this program, uh, your the proof is in in the pudding that you offer tonight. The the transformation from uh, just all I couldn't keep track of the of the treatments that you mentioned, and and I just my journey is so different, and I'm also very much the same. And I'm just so impressed with the transformation and and everything that you share. Uh, something resonated on one level, and especially talking about the fact that this is not a no-drink program, but really looking at the the spiritual principles and and kind of being rebuilt um, by service and focusing on others. Um, there were so many things that you said that I thought, wow, that I, I've been there. Especially as you talked about being on vacation uh, or or being at the vacation home of your father after he passed, and and thinking about suicide. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things where before I really found this program, I thought something's really wrong with me because I've I've got a lot going for me. And I think a lot of people would be envi envious of me, but I'm so angry and so miserable. And, and really, uh, another thing that you said about fighting with your wife on dates, you know, I, I find that when I'm focusing on myself and trying to do self-care and focusing on my own happiness, that, that is when I, I get really irritable and really cranky and end up fighting with other people. And, and it is the focusing on the needs of other people where I am finding more and more my, my deep satisfaction. Um, you know, the, I found this meeting in, in the middle of this past year. Uh, I've been, I'm 11 years sober this year uh, but I did not work the steps uh, not properly. And um, I've been doing that this year. And I really, really was on the brink of, of probably doing some real harm to myself. And, um, and this group has, has really revolutionized my, my journey. And I've been, I've been on a journey of being rebuilt from the inside out. So I want to thank Sam. I want to thank everyone in this meeting. And Aaron, thanks for sharing your journey. Thank you. Man. So uh, I'm going to share real quick the, um, you know, 10 years ago, um, I had, I told that funny story poking the ear and about pulling him out of that flea bag place that time or a couple of times. But I remember my wife at the time was out of town and we were having a really rocky marriage, you know, and all these business things were not going right and all this stuff. And, somehow Aaron would keep calling me and, and, um, uh, I brought him home to my house. I was like, you're just going to come stay with me for the weekend. You know? And I was, um, you know, I, you know, I don't know. I brought him home to my house. You know, my wife was gone. There's nobody there. And, um, and we're just gonna, I'm just going to sit on this dude for a little bit and I'm getting ready to go to bed. And Aaron comes out and he, he stumbles over and he finally goes, look, man, the drunk was starting to wear off. You know, and he's like, you know, kind of gets that fog. Look, where am I, you know, where am I at? And why am I here kind of thing? And, you know, everybody has a couple people that are just, you know, it's probably way codependent, probably not the right way to do this stuff. But, you know, everybody has somebody, it's almost like they've got an umbilical cord attached to them. You know, a few of these people that are so special, it's like God puts them, you, you guys are just meant to, to, be on the firing line together. And I remember he goes, man, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I got to get the fuck out of here and get something to drink, man. And uh, I appreciate all you've done for me, blah, blah, blah. And I go, hey, man, you don't need to go anywhere. There's some liquor downstairs. I mean, my wife at the time drank. We had a big party house. And that's a long, whole nother story. But, you know, we had a, a cabinet down there. And I go, I'm going to tell you a little trick. I got some stuff down here. So you don't need to go. You don't need to go anywhere. And that morning I'm waking up to go to breakfast and this guy is passed out on my foyer. Like, as I come down the staircase, you know, he's laying on the floor on the wood and you look back at those moments and you go like never in a million years would I think that God would have put, I mean, my whole, my life is filled with these stories, but where everything in my life superficially started to collapse. And I have this, um, this drunk dude 
it was almost a Jerry Maguire moment. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen that where uh, he's just, everything's going down and, and he's sitting there and he's looking over at uh, um, God, Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character, you know, and they're in the airport. And he's looking at him. He just lost all of his clients and that's his only client left is Cuba Gooding Jr. You know, this guy that was kind of like this B player. And he goes, why are you even with me, Ray? You know, he goes, I am cloaked in failure, you know, <laughs> and that's how that's I've had this. I had one of those moments, you know, uh, and I remember he uh, he called me at work. And in the company, this it was just a shitty season in my life where I just had all these dependencies and I built up. all. I mean, it was just it was all of my own doing. It wasn't happening to me. It was happening from me. But it doesn't make it that makes it even more painful sometimes. Right. And I'm walking outside on the deck of this place that I is starting to kind of crumble and the and the wife and I she's wanting to leap she's basically she's saying hey you know when we first were together we've really grown apart all you care about is this alcoholic helping alcoholics thing and the spiritual thing you don't you're not into my family it's just a long thing and she basically said you know there's no I don't want to rebuild this I don't want to work on it I just don't want to do it uh and um the plug just was 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 pulled out and I was pretty heartbroken and discouraged. And I was at work one day and Aaron called me another, another one of those times where he's like, call me, do you think it's really possible? You know, he's a, he's a month sober or two months over. And my wife had just gotten done telling me that, you know, all I cared about was working with drunks and doing all this stuff. And I cared about a more than my family and blah, blah, blah. And, and, um, I walked outside and I go, I remember I was so, I, I, I felt this passion. I go, dude, I need you to stay sober. I need it to work this time. I need you to do this for me. So I don't feel like all this is a bunch of bullshit. I need to realize that all the stuff that's crumbling around me is going to be you and me, baby. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to hold your fucking hand up at a year sober. And even if the rest of the world is all, you know, even if we're on just a little bitty spike of land around a moat of shit, it's going to be you and me. And this is going to have been worth something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I think that God puts these people in our lives to where that conduit stays open between us. You know, that conduit uh, stays open and never in a million years, you know, would I have thought that we were having, you know, this kind of a dialogue with all these people here and that God's love is flowing through us and through other people. And that's just a real, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, that's where the real um, joy and peace and and when I really find meaning in life I mean you know to me I don't think I don't even like the word emotional sobriety you know it, it's kind of got that negative connotation just because of all the shit that was going down in the 80s and everybody thinks oh god he thinks he's got some secret AA sect at a conference you know these weird people from the 80s might be talking about something different that's not you know I don't even necessarily like that term that much anymore uh but I really love when it talks about it, it talks about its humility. What it really is, is humility in relation with ourselves, with our fellows and with God. My, that when I find my position, when I find whatever position God wants me to play and I get in that position, it's amazing. Doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what the outcome is. I'm feeling, I'm, I'm in a sense of peace and presence, you know, and it's, it's easy for me to get knocked out of that from time to time. And I think that's why people put Aaron in my life and, and me in his life, you know, is when I get wrapped around the axles, the way back to it, the way back to finding my position, the way back to finding peace, the way back to finding that humility is, is us helping each other, you know, uh, find our way back to the presence of God by, by love and service. Um, anyway, uh, let's raise, anybody else got their hand raised? I'm not calling on. Let's see. I don't know about what about uh what about uh Wendy or Chris, our friends from Astoria. Oh, it's, Chris is saying Wendy's turn this time. Is that right, Chris? It's Wendy's turn. Wendy, it's your turn. Okay, Wendy White, alcoholic. Thanks for calling on me, Sam. I absolutely loved your sh your share, uh, Aaron. That that was great, and you too, Sam. And we were just commenting to each other. Uh, I don't think I could stand to be in the same room with both of you guys. <laughs> you just suck all the air out. But man, what a great testimony. What a great um, picture that you've, you've given us. Um, I was talking to a sponsee today about service that 
you can't explain to someone in AA the benefit of being of service to someone else. Just in the same way you can't explain to a drunk the benefit of staying sober. It is an experience that you have to have and uh, you can only get it by doing it. Um, and that's the, the beauty of this program is it's built in, you know, it's step 12, take the, carry the message. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful thing. I too have uh, really appreciated this, this meeting all year. Um, it's helped ground me in the program and, and made other uh, Zoom meetings tolerable. <laughs> so I really appreciate you being there and uh, thanks for calling on me. Thank you, Wendy. We appreciate you coming this week. Uh, let's see who else we got here. What about Veronica? Hey, Sam. I, th I thought you were gonna ask me. I feel like uh, my name's Veronica, alcoholic. And I thought, yeah, I bet I get asked tonight. I feel like crap. That'll, that'll happen. Aaron, I really, I love your style too. I've got a few things I want to say just in no particular order. I will say that this year is the first year I was reflecting just, you know, uh, on a couple of the lines in the, the, um, in the letter uh, just the last few days and, you know, um, about depression. And this is the first year. I can't speak to the four years or the years before the last four years, but this is the first summer. For some reason, the last few years, it's hit me every summer. And this is the first year that I haven't felt that depression, that, you know, extended three, four months of just depression. Don't know why, but I'll tell you, it's, I think, I think it is in part a testament to continually hearing, turning up and just hearing and reading. And I get the privilege of reading this letter, which let me tell you, I'm one of those people, I need things to go over and over and over and over again. That's me. Um, I had, a, I also liked your, you know, the thing you were talking about, the box, you know, the pros and the cons, the, the one side, you know, the drinking and then the non-drinking, uh, that really appealed to me and I actually could really relate to it. So I'm glad you brought it up, even though you said, you know, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a particularly an, an AA thing, um, but that exercise that somebody went through or took you through. And I guess really all I want to say is that I, um, what I've noticed in, well, <sighs> Where are we? Thursday, Tuesday. And I say this not with theatrics, but Tuesday, I thought, I don't think this is for me. I don't get it. I'm not talking about emotional sobriety. I'm talking about AA in general and particularly one of the steps I'm struggling with. And I really thought, wow, I think this is the end. I think I've come to the end of my, my line. I'm not going to get this. So anyway, here we are Thursday and I've turned up and read the, read the letter. So I guess it just, uh, it goes on. But what I've come to see this, particularly this last year, 18 months, the difference for me being able to turn up and listen week after week to people that I feel that just get it so much better than I do. I'm just like, you just, it, that's what it sounds like and feels like to me. I feel like an outsider looking in. I'm watching other people get things and realize things and they're having experienced things. Um, and that's not necessarily my experience. But what has happened is I've started to really notice in this last 12 months some of the things about uh, myself, my behaviors, my isms, my character structure. You know, things that really surprise the hell out of me, you know, which, of course, then, you know, it all dovetails into emotional sobriety or the, you know, the working on the emotional and the spiritual sobriety and then maturity. So that, you know, if I've got a half assed chance at living the rest of this life as a physically, emotionally and spiritually sober um, woman, and having this experience at the most 
mature version of Veronica that I can be? Well, I'm telling you, this, this weekly meeting really makes a difference for me. So anyway, thanks for asking. See ya. Beautiful. Not yet. Uh, Don? What about friend Don? Hi, Sam. Aaron, when I saw that you were doing the meeting tonight, I was so excited because I knew that you were going to bring some energy to the house. Um, I didn't know how much you were going to bring, and it's been great. Um, I'm a little sleepy tonight, so I needed it. Um, first of all, I'm sorry for your losses. That's a lot to deal with in um, sobriety, and you know I've had to deal with some of that myself, so I really do kind of get it. Yeah, kind of. You never know what it's like personally, but um, it takes a, a lot to walk through some things sober and it uh, uh, builds character. <laughs> it just, it builds character. I read, a, um, I've had a little bit of a, you know, I was on here last week and I wasn't exactly, you know, in my shoes. And this week I've had a I've had to, you know, wake up to a few things this week and waking up is never fun. It's never fun. I like what Tom said. I know I go to sleep because I have to wake up and I'm waking up. So, <laughs> and today, one of the things that I was waking up to was just dealing with some real, you know, feelings that I'm not, feelings I don't like, you know, I have a few feelings that I'm not willing to accept. And when they come around, I welcome them to leave and then they just stay, it's weird they take residency in the living room and then you just got to deal with them at some point. But I really appreciated you reminding me that me, you know, talking about how I feel and, um, you know, getting in the hot tub <laughs> and doing all this ain't going to help me, <laughs> you know, it's theorizing how I'm going to move out of this is not going to help me. I'll come back next week and be just as miserable. And the um, fortune is that, you know, I live kind of live alone in the mountains by myself, so I can get really consumed with me on me, uh, you know. So um, you really brought it tonight. Thank you for reminding me that the way that I get outside of me is to get with you and to help you. And um, the thing that I would like to say is, and I, it just, just hammered home for me, um, Tom brings it up and he, he brought it up the book writing of the big book. It talks in there about moral psychology. And we, we were talking about it in a study that we're looking at. And, you know, I looked it up and I went back and looked again because it's like, it tells you what moral psychology is. I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to give you any paraphrasing or any quotes. It basically says that as alcoholics, we are extremely self-centered and the moral psychology is shifting us from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. And this, you know, we have to have that thing happen to us or it's impossible. And then somewhere else in the books, it says all the wonderful things that it says, and I'm not a big page quoter because I, you know, I work with turpentine a lot. I mean, I, I have this small chemical dependency thing that went on with me. But anyway, it says we must be, it does not say we must get sober get removed from alcohol of course we have to do that but what it says is we must be rid of this selfishness or it kills us and i mean that's pretty like punch you right in the face if you want to continue to maintain that self-centeredness good luck and um thank you for reminding me how to get out of my own pit and i'll see y'all next week and i too bow down to serve this meeting <laughs> I think um, right when you said that we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness we must or it kills us. And then it says God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. I think the way God makes it possible is he puts Aaron Hams all over the world and Sam and Corey's and Veronica's and Maggie's, you know, I think that's what, I think that's, that's one of the ways God makes that possible, you know? So um Aaron, what you got any final words for us, man, before we go? Anything you thought of that we uh that that while other people were sharing? 
Hey everybody, Aaron, alcoholic still, you know, no, no real final words. Uh, I, it was, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Veronica, when she was sharing, she said she related to that box thing. I, I left off a, a, a crucial part of that. Um, at the end, it talks about, you know, we suffer the pings, the cons of, you know, whatever nervousness or anxiety, and, and we look for the relaxation. He goes, what we find, though, when we work the steps thoroughly, he goes, the, the cons of sobriety generally tend to dissipate, and we gain the pros of drinking yet sober. You know, I'm relaxed today. I'm ha I like myself today. That was probably the number one thing that I didn't have. I never truly liked myself. Um, in any way, I, I, I'll tell you, I was in a mental hospital in, uh, in Atlanta one time and, um, I was bucking the rules. Imagine that, you know, and I wasn't doing anything right. And they pulled me in the conference, in the doctor's office and they called my mom and they put her on speaker and they didn't tell her I was in the room. They wanted me to like overhear this conversation to kind of like shock me or intimidate me. <clears throat> and they said, Miss Ham, they said, we got Aaron here and he's not following any of the rule. You know, he's just, he's, you know not doing anything right. They go, and we can keep him here indefinitely. They said, we don't need a court order. We are above all that. It's just, if we say he never leaves, he never leaves. Um, they're like, we need somebody who knows him to try to get through to him so that he, you know, works with, and my mom's on speakerphone, remember, and she just sighed real deeply into the phone. She goes, oh, she said, listen, she goes, Aaron's not going to do anything he doesn't want to do. She goes, you can't scare him. He doesn't care about consequences. She's like, we have tried everything at the end of the day he's not going to do anything if he doesn't want to do it and i always joke if if i had heard overheard that phone call in high school or something i would have thought that was so cool i would you know i'd have been like you know you ought to remember that nurse you know like it's you know it's the way it is but i'm like 31 in a mental hospital with nowhere to live no friends no money no you know you know and it and it hit me i was like oh damn but the point the only reason I, the only reason i say that because I'm not on probation. I'm not, I have, I would not be <laughs> doing this AA stuff and service work and putting up with all the crap I put, I would not do it if there wasn't a payoff. Um, so anyway, I, I just love the effects that I get from this program. And I, I can't thank the, the people enough that, uh, um, you know, blaze the trail. Don, it's funny. I, I always get a lot out of what you share. I didn't even know you knew who I was. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, but anyway, I just, I love you guys, this meeting. And um, I don't know, this stuff works. People used to go, you know, I they cart you into a meeting somewhere and they'd be like, it works if you were, this works. I'm like, look, old man, buckle your overalls. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, I'm, le you know, I'm just here because I'm court ordered. You know what I'm saying? It works. I got problems. And uh, it turns out it's true. It really does work. So anyway, love you guys. That's real. Sorry, Sam. That's really all I got, bro. So, yeah. Thank, thank you, man. Love you, buddy. Let's uh, we'll mute ourselves and go to our inner rooms and say the Lord's prayer. Beautiful. Great job tonight, Aaron. Thank you so much. Thanks for trucking around with me, buddy. Oh, thank you, man. I love you guys, man. I was honored. Um, so yeah, anything I can ever do, all you gotta do is call. So thank you, my brother. Love you, buddy. I love you. Thanks, Thanks so much again, Aaron. Thanks, Bye guys. Thank you,